Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. It's Dr. Homebrew, and today is a good show day for you, for you to listen to, and for us to talk to you about, because we have zero homebrew today. It's one of our uh, special commercial calibration shows, so we're going to be drinking a Kolsch. Cooper, what's the name? It's Fru Kolsch. Fle Kolsch. Fru. Fle. You can call it Fru, or you can call it Fru. Fle. Fle Kolsch. So you want to, the, the U umlaut yeah. sound is you make, like, uh, an O sound, but you kind of, or are you kind of make a oo sound and kind of make your mouth kind of ooh. Ooh. okay, well whatever. Like, or you like kind of an e-ish sound. I don't know. It's a weird sound. Yeah. Yeah. I, agree. I don't have any of it, so uh, you boys are on your own to talk about this. And then in the second time, or the second, the second segment even of the show, we're going to be chatting a little bit about proctoring an exam. And, yes, uh, we're, this is called I don't proctoring. Know what that- Proctoring yes. for dummies. Yes, right. We're not okay, talking yes. about your, your proctologist here. We're talking no, about that's like, true. beer exam proctoring. So that's we're going true. to talk about, we're going to make the ooze and the kush. No, the, we're not doing that anymore. We've moved on. Yeah, ich, ich yeah. Die kush. Yeah. Uh, but before we get to the Kolsch, we want to thank our sponsor, Five Star. You go to fivestarchemicals.com and learn about everything there is to know about cleaning and sanitizing your homebrew. And that is to use Five Star Chemicals. It's odd. It's weird. It sounds like a scam, but it's not. The, the website that tells you everything about what to do involves using the company's products that make the best products for the thing you have to do. It's a whole thing. It's very, very easy, actually. So I, I'm really out. confused I, about what you just said there. Yeah, Brian, are you? <laughs> Thank you for interrupting me to tell me that. <laughs> Go to fivestarchemicals.com. Man, this is, show is already a mess. I feel like we should put it off. I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, fivestarchemicals.com. No, let's not put it off. This is great radio, man. No, it sucks. All right, boys. Kolsch. <laughs> let's do a commercial calibration. So we're going to see if this is a, is this a classic style, Cooper? A yeah, classic yes. example of a style. Is Why, yes, it is. Okay, perfect. So, uh, you know, these are always tough, these, these uh, imported European styles, because, you know, it's, it has to come over from, you know, Europe and then to the East Coast and then, on top of a box car from the East coast over here. So who knows how damaged this thing is. So I'm sure our experts, Shar and Cooper are going to be uh, uh, doing their best to overlook any sort of travel damage and, uh, and, and really sort of see if this is a classic example of the style or not. And you know, where it could use some improvement, which is sort of the point of this whole thing. Right. Well, as as someone who has gone to Cologne and, and tasted uh, a, a number of the local uh, colches there, I I can tell you it, it is a lot better over there <laughs> than what you get here in the can. So I imagine, yeah. Sometimes you luck out and get a pretty decently traveled uh, can or bottle of it, uh, but yeah, it's kind of the luck of the draw. It's a it's a lighter style. You know, this one is four point eight percent alcohol by volume. It's not a heavy beer by any chance. There's a lot of delicate flavors that need to come out. So um, we'll see what we get. Did you get a can or a bottle, Brian? I got a bottle at okay. Total Wine. And okay. uh, I. it was at the very bottom shelf. It was kind of in the back away. So it was kind of out of the way of light. But it's still clearly been there for quite some time. Okay. Yeah. It and you're right, you know, I, a... I've never had the pleasure of having had Kolsch in Cologne, in, in but, you know, my, I wish we could have my brother on the show. He did his NATO tour in the Air Force just outside of Cologne, and his commanding officer was British. So uh, they used to all, like his whole team, like to go to, they would all go to Cologne, like on a, on a Friday afternoon and just go from Kolsch brewery to Kolsch brewery just walk back and forth and just drink all this stuff all all afternoon right and and when you're there you know they 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 mark it on your coaster you just have your coaster and as you you know you empty your glass you just uh put the empty glass on your coaster and they come around it's it's served in a stange which is a tall skinny cylindrical uh uh kind of even-sided glass and uh, they come around with these big uh, things full of them and they just replace your empty beers. They're always served in two centiliter volumes. So it's always, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of, it's a beer that I like to drink colder than most styles because you want to drink it 
fresh and cold and, and have that crispness, not too, too cold, but uh, usually you're not drinking it at, you know, the bottom of a pint glass and it's warm, but as a, as a homebrew judge, so, you know, some of the best versions I've had of it here, of course, have been, uh, you know, really good homebrewed versions of it. So we would encourage our, yes. our, our listeners to, to, to brew some of this and send us some that hasn't had to travel so far to get here and, and, and is relatively fresh because a lot of times they, you can do just as good a, a job as they do there and, and get it, get it pretty right. So. And, um, and we're real lucky in the Bay area where, uh, you know, uh, uh, my, uh, my friend Christian Kazakoff, who's a brewer at Canyon club, uh, in Moraga, formerly at iron Springs in, uh, in Marin, uh, guy makes an incredible Kolsch. And I was just at Canyon club for the first time the other day. And man, that is, he's, he makes like two, two different Kolsches, uh, and they're both just phenomenal. Uh, and he, just getting, getting it fresh. This is a style where I agree with you. Getting it fresh is important. And there's a reason why the Germans serve it in those little 20 CL glasses. They're like a taster, taster glass. Uh, I, I, I don't know the exact conversion off the top of my head, but essentially you're getting like a taster size glass in the U S maybe like four ounces, six ounces. So mm -hmm. you drink it, it's cold. They're always bringing you more. You don't have to wait when you polish one off. Uh, it's always getting served to you at the right temperature. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, two two centiliters is about uh, zero point six seven. Oh, hold on, no, it's twenty. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, not two centiliters. What is mm. it? 20, 20 centiliters is yeah six point seven six fluid ounces. Yeah, yeah. so kind of like a, a large taster. Yeah, <clears throat> well, it's it's a light beer, so you can put put away a good number or of them. It's, it's, like, it's a half it's a half it's, pint. It's a half beer, yeah, yeah, and not even a half pint. It's just a half twelve ouncer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, that's good. Good point. You're right. All right. Well, uh, let's crack this beer. We can start talking about it a little bit. Uh, you know, overall impression on the beer. It should be a, a clean, crisp, delicately balanced beer, um, and and it's a low uh, low ale, ale temperature fermented beer. So. It, it's generally not as fruity as most uh, ale beers. Uh, it's going to be, it's 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 kind of a hybrid style in that it's it's a low temperature uh, uh, ale, fermented out and, and and usually fermented out nice and dry and crisp, and then lagered for, you know, a reasonably short time just to give it some some smoothness and and uh, you know, uh, kind of clean up any of the. Any, anything that that needs to be cleaned up there in uh, in lagering. So the Germans like their lagering. I just cracked the can here, and it's uh, the date on the bottom of this one is is November thirtieth, uh, wow, twenty twenty one. That's the expiration date, I believe. So they expect okay. this to last. I bought it oh, a wow. while ago. So was that six months? Is generally the thing. So when was that brewed? April, something like possibly, that. Possibly, possibly. Yeah, I I bought it. Uh, earlier in the summer for a beer judging uh, a group that was going on. My buddy Herendu was, was uh, tasting beers with. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's not bad. We did a lot I of wish category I had found fives. a can rather than a bottle. I think it would have come across a little fresher. You know the, yeah, I, I actually bought both the cans and the bottles and I opened the bottle with the, the group that we tasted with and it. It was not as, as kind of fresh and clean as hoped, but this one seems to have promise here. It's, it's it's light in the aroma, really you know low maltiness in there. Did you open yours, Brian? Uh, I did. I okay. poured myself here and nice. it, coming out of the big. It's it's the large bottle. It's not a twenty two ounce uh, bottle, but it's kind of the larger sized uh, European uh, slash German bottle. And the um, the aroma is just overwhelmingly cardboard. I couldn't mm -hmm. find a. A date in, in, I could read in English, but the the aroma is just nothing but cardboard. Yeah, that was kind of what I had on the bottles. Bummer. Okay, uh, I'm and that, not. And that's a lot why the can is a superior package in a lot of ways, right? Because in some ways, some styles benefit from that micro oxidation of a little bit of oxygen getting in through the cap. There's always going to be some level of oxi oxygen coming in through the cap, in a can for better or worse. Your that thing's sealed up. It's sealed up. You're not going to get <laughs> oxygen coming through. Whatever oxygen is in there is what you got in there at packaging. 
Yeah. Uh, as long and as if, you, if you're it. getting oxygen in, then you're leaking. There's like no middle ground. Right. Yeah, as long as they control it well and, and, and can it well. And I'm sure these guys know what they're doing there. So uh, yeah, you, 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 you know, I, they can afford a DO meter and uh, make mm. sure that it's nice and low. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. yeah. So I'm getting a low, yeah. Just a light malt aroma, lightly sweet, kind of, you know, a little grainy. And uh, the, the fruit is faint. There's just a little apple, a uh, little apple kind of ester in there, but it's not real heavy at all. It's not like a, not like a, a cream ale or something kind of a fruitiness. It's a, should that be in, there? in between, almost like a, almost like a lager, but it's just got a little hint of that fruit. Okay. Um, is that a right? Nice. What was that? Is that a right to be there? Yeah. 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 It should have a little fruitiness. It's, it's an ale. Uh, but it's a low temperature ale, usually fermented in the lower, lower sixties or, or, or probably even sometimes a little lower than that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the hops that they use are going to be, you know, kind of the, uh, traditional, like, you know, um, uh, noble hops and with a floral kind of spicy impression. And this one has a little spiciness to it. It's got a little, little spiciness and a, maybe a faint floral behind that, but it's mostly a little spicy kind of zaz like nose uh it can also be expressed as a little bit herbal um and in the the guidelines it says some some yeast strains may give a slight whiny or sulfury character uh but that's also also an optional thing so it's there is you know um some variation in the style and and they're brewed by so many different houses there it's not like they all have the same recipe and they're all doing uh, the same beer, but it's just, you know, the name Kolsch is, is just, it's a, an appellation. Basically it's, you know, uh, there was something called the Kolsch convention a long, you know, long time ago. And they, I would go there. They just, yeah. Uh, you know, some, some of them are drier. They're going to seem a little hoppier and, uh, and brighter. Some are, are even more attenuated than others. Uh, but generally they're, they're fairly well attenuated. I don't really come across that whiny yeast character a little bit. You can have like a little bit of, of uh, sulfury kind of lager like character, but it's usually not really prominent and, and it's not in too many examples. This one doesn't seem to have any of that. Um, but yeah, it should just be balanced and, and, and fresh smelling. I'm sorry, <laughs> Brian, <laughs> we tried. Um, <laughs> appearance is uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, this one is a, is a, is a pale gold. And um, it's, it should be very clear. It needs to be filtered to a brilliant clarity. Um, if it's yeah, aged, mine, mine might be a little old, but it's still yes. crystal clear. Yeah, nice. Um, uh, the, the head on mine is sticking around pretty well. It's it 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 doesn't always persist super well. It's a pretty light beer, yeah, and it's not all about the head. They just pour it in those skinny little things. It has a little head that kind of fluffs up, and then it stays for a little while, but it's so light it just kind of dissipates after a little while and that's fine but uh usually you're drinking some fast it <laughs> doesn't matter you know half a beer at a time um flavor wise um okay yeah i'm getting a little honey like in the malt and i think that's probably maybe a little oxidation starting to creep in or starting to like a little bit age on the beer but it's actually not offensive um it has uh it's a pretty soft gentle beer it's it's going to be you know four and a half to you know five percent barely cracking five if you if you have one at six it's it's not right jp right <laughs> no <laughs> low, alcohol, no. low alcohol beer yeah absolutely like um, a six and a half percent pale ale yeah nope we're not going to do that if you do that with a mm. colch and send it to us we'll kick you out mm. um and it's not a, not a bitter beer, but it does it has a crispness to it. it has a nice dry finish, and um, you just drink it and you get the malt with a little hop behind it, but not a hop bitterness so much. And it just dries it off the, the palate, and then you want another sip, and uh, you go down pretty smooth. The fruity sweetness in the flavor is, it's it's like a cross between think of a cross between a lager and an ale. It's this one has. So it actually has in, in mouthfeel wise almost has a little bit of carbonic, you know, the bikes are fairly highly carbonated, mm-hmm. you know, medium to medium high. Um, 
and they're so well attenuated that, and there's, there's not a whole lot of flavor there that you, you taste almost like a, the, in this one, I'm tasting kind of a seltzery like quality. It's like pretty, this one's pretty highly carbonated in this can and it, it's uh, maybe a little higher than I might like, but it's, it's actually not bad. It's, 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 it's kind of pulling some of the flavors out of there and, and playing off some of the stuff there. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, soft malt, a little honey like, which maybe shouldn't be there, but um, should just be kind of a grainy, sweet, light breadiness. Uh, actually, it can have a little honey, honey like quality. And I don't know if that yeah. is for me or not, but. Yeah, my, my flavor is not quite as affected by the oxidation as the aroma is. And I, you know, my, my example uh, being more oxidized than yours definitely has some honey, uh, but also it does have, I mean, there's, it's not quite as effervescent as yours, but it's still fairly carbonated. Uh, it's very pleasant malt. It's, it's easy drinking. It's, it's a light in body. Yeah, and the, uh, there's a lot of range that can be allowed in uh, the hop characters too. Um, the fruit culch to me, it's it's mostly the spicy with a little. It actually has a little floral and herbal yeah. behind that, but the, the spice is kind of winning. Um, and uh, you know, it comes in the initial sip, you get that that malt, and then it, it dries off, and then the hop kind of expresses in the late palate. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree with you that the different Kolsch's have different uh, different hop levels. I mean, I'm, I don't live on the peninsula anymore. If you do live on the peninsula in the Bay Area, House Stout in Redwood City is an amazing place to get German style beers. They must FedEx them in or something because they're always, they're never, they're rarely stale. They're nice. always in great shape. Uh, and I've used to love, uh, I would get Reisdorf Kolsch from there. And Reisdorf, to me, I, I liked it because it was, I guess the Germans would say, very firmly bitter. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and that's kind of the place where I learned, oh, I'm getting some fresh beers. Like Oktoberfest can be firmly bitter. You know, it's not an IPA. These beers are not, you know, definitely not IPAs. Right. But they, uh, when you get these German beers fresh, they often have more hop bitterness and more hop character overall than you might be used to having them if you just get like examples that have been sitting on the shelf somewhere for a year and a half three years <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. yeah it's not going to be ipa bitterness but the bitterness can go up to medium it's going to be you know medium right. low at least to to a medium level and but it's not going to you know not going to be any biting or harsh aftertaste it's just there boom it kind of balances against the malt and and the other flavors that are there the fruitiness the light fruitiness that's there and then it dries off your tongue and you get the hops and want another sip exactly oh yeah um yeah they it can also have uh some of them can have a little bit of wheat in it so if you get a little wheat like flavor in some of them that you have to allow for that it's not a fault again there's a lot of a lot of range but most of them are fairly just light and um you know, well, a uh, well lagered light ale kind of, you know, low, low fruity ale and um, just German characteristic ingredients, but not as malty as, you know, it's not anywhere near like Bach or, yeah, it's just like, it's, it's a light <laughs> drinker. It's, you know, it, it's hard to say what it's similar to because it's not really like a, a pills doesn't have the hop of a pills. Uh, it can have a little bit of that kind of mineraliness that you get in a, in a pill sometimes some of them have a little, little mineral quality to them um or you can get a little sulfur but it's it's gonna it's it's that kind of lager ale uh hybrid that's kind of makes it makes it fun and real easy drinking um mouthfeel wise it's a it's a medium light to medium body this one i would say it feels kind of medium light uh Carbonation can be medium to medium high. This one's probably towards the medium high. Uh, smooth and generally crisp and well attenuated. That's definitely the case for me here. So crispness to me is a defining part of the, the style. It just has to, to drink crisp and just dry off the tongue. You're left with a little hop and then, yeah. Um, refreshing, like it has to be. And uh, yeah, drinking them in the summer and drinking a 
fair amount of them and and uh, uh you know they so then you mark off the coaster they they bring up bring you a new one they mark your coaster with another one and uh, and then when you're when you're done you 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 flip the coaster over to signal that you don't don't want any more of them so uh, then they know you're done and then you cash out with the server when they come back to you so um it's it's just kind of funny you just got like float in cologne from from kolsch brewery to kolsch brewery uh there's one downtown called dome kolsch that's that's fun to visit and i i didn't make it to nearly all of them at all but is this a um, recap trip what do you guys <laughs> <laughs> the one time the I beer, was in boys. Cologne, I didn't know yeah. anything about beer, and I, the only thing I knew no, about I beer didn't. hardly was I had I had Michael Jackson's uh, little pocket <sighs> world world guide to beer, not Michael Jackson the singer, oh, of course, no. but the beer writer. And there's a place called Beer University uh, somewhere in Cologne, and I ended up we were there. <laughs> JP's like, oh my god, I can't. Uh, we closed that place down at like three four o'clock in the morning. Not vacations that you took. That was a long time ago. Yeah, good. Well, good. A, part, a part of the beer is the experience of having the beer in Cologne. So yeah, but I, will, I will argue against that. I, I want to uh, have that over experience here, We're over here robbing uh, Total Wine. So should, let's just remember should, where we are. I did not Thank rob you. them, to be fair. I went well, and I, I, I got down on my knees. Right, and I, I, got it. So I where, reached where way do, back and I paid for that Kolsch. Where do we leave off with the, uh, the, the tasting notes here, boys? So we're on the, the mouthfeel. I've, I've already kind of gone over the overall impression. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, in Germany, it's characterized as a top fermented lager beer. Um, and each brewery makes a different, different version of it. And they interpret the Kolsch convention a little differently. So as a judge, when you're tasting these, you have to, you know, allow for that range. Sometimes some can have a little wheat, some can have a little whiny or sulfury character. Some can be more minerally. Okay. It's all acceptable as long as they're, refreshing and crisp and uh yeah sadly they have a pretty pretty short uh shelf life and um getting oxidation especially in the bottles i would suggest trying to get a can if you're able to yeah um, i'm having a little better experience with brian is here but uh <laughs> yeah i interpret the convention to do mean that the can is better yeah we should have the yeah. can when possible so uh yeah the 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 Kolsch convention happened in 1986, so you can't call anything else a Kolsch in America. If you brew a you know a Kolsch, you have to call it like a you know Kolsch style or something. Bullshit. I hate that so much. Anyway, that's yeah. the worst. I that shit. You know, I understand it's an appellation or whatever, and it's protected or whatever. But no one's gonna think that XYZ Craft Brewery, who just opened, is importing their coal. Like it just, it's just a completely and utterly ridiculous nonsense. Fucking call sometime, it. A coal. I hate sometime it. when we're real bored, we'll talk about like the decades long battle over Parmesan cheese. No, we're uh, never going to do that. I there's been a, there's been like a decades no. long legal battle. No, we're about never going to talk about it. Par- no, we're Brian, Parma. shut up, Brian. Yeah. Cooper, All go right. ahead, please. Well, we'll just finish this out. The vital stats, you know, it's going to, it's going to start 1044 to 1050, go to 1007 to 1011. It dries out pretty well. Yep. Um, IBUs have a little range. They can go 18 up to 30. So kind of almost to pale ale territory in some of them, but usually a little lower. Uh, the colors, you know, three and a half to five SRM and ABV is going to be you know, again, like four and a half to five, 4.4 to 5.2 ish territory. Right. Um, but that's a Kolsch and uh, you know, you have to really go there to taste it. Right. But if you get a, a fresh can that just came off the truck, you might look out and have a pretty good experience. I'm having a reasonably good experience right now. And I'm, I'm yeah. This. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Like for, you know, for, for German Kolsch's in America, it, they are hit or miss, but I, and I've, I've grabbed a few off the shelf and reasonably, I think the worst one I've had just sort of tastes like honey. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like it's definitely heat damaged, or but you can still have a decent time with it. So right, don't right. poo-poo it. Um, you know, going to Bevmo and like grabbing a warm one off the shelf or whatever. If you want to try an actual style, it, it's it's sort of a gamble, but it's not going to be the worst. Kolsch is still not is still not awful. But better yet, just brew on it, and they're you know, I mean, it's a it's going to be a relatively uh, you know simple <laughs> yeah uh, recipe there is, there is a question in the chat actually from richard 
And he says, uh, he, as he's watching the show, he was creating a Kolsch recipe for his first ever 10 gallon batch. Which grain do you prefer as a base malt? And do we have any experience thoughts on the Omega Kolsch 2 yeast? Uh, I'm always going to say just go White Labs. Um, that's yeah. just me. But uh, yeah. what, I, I'm not what familiar base malt with Omega, Omega yeah. yeast, Jim. What base just malt should we uh, get a German, a, a, a classic German Pils malt? Um, and, you know, good traditional. Agreed. Uh, Hollertau, you know, Noble Hop, Tetnang, Spalt, or Harrisbrooker. And, uh, you know, make sure you, whatever yeast you use, is that it is attenuative, clean, and ferments well at a reasonably low temperature. Um, you can throw in a little wheat if you want, but it's really not that common. Uh, but yeah, ferment, you know, moderately warm, and, and then just make sure you lager it. That's that's the, the big part. You can you can yeah. do that in a keg too if you you know if you if you keg mm -hmm. it and uh just wait to carbonate it and then you know let it lager out and then and uh you know pressure carbonate it it should be fine yeah. and i i'm a fan of weirman german pills uh malt they're not a sponsor no one's paying for that that's just personally <laughs> and uh, a friend in my homebrew club that brews a lot of german style beers is weirman exclusively you know, he makes great beer, wins a lot of competitions. Uh, I've just always liked that malt. I'm sure others are good, but just personally, if you have a choice, I'd suggest uh, try Environment. There yep. you go. All right, Richard, good real, luck. Real, real similar to a pills recipe, just lighter on the hops and mm -hmm. and everything kind of. So and yeah. probably a little higher temperature lager fermentation. There you go. Good luck, Richard. Let us know how it uh, turns out. If you want to enter your beer and Dr. Homebrew, Brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. Uh, all right, is that it for, for our Kolsch uh, commercial calibration? I think so. Unless there's more yeah, questions yeah. in the chat, but Love it. You know, we're always happy to take a question. You don't, you don't have to just send beer requests to me at uh, brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. You can send us questions and we'll, we'll try to answer them That's on true. the air. We've done some of that before too. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break, everybody, and we're going to come back. We're going to talk proctoring a BJCP exam. We'll be right back. This is Dr. Homebrew. All right, everyone, thanks for sticking around. It's Dr. Homebrew. We are back, and we have a special guest, the great Dave Techum. Now, Dave is a BJCP Grandmaster Level 7 judge. Uh, Brian Shar and Brian Cooper are like, I don't even know, level doesn't even matter anymore. One. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a one. Grandmaster That's good one. enough for me. Dave Techum is Grandmaster 7. And that is, uh, I don't even know how, it just, it, it seems like it's way off in the distance. It's like, uh, you know, Jupiter to our Venus. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the, the program recognizes people who, who do service to the organization in educating members, uh, you know, bringing up new members, giving exams, people proctoring exams. Yep. And all of this service to the BGCP counts towards points and grading exams that go towards your, your rank. So once you hit Grandmaster, sure. you also have to judge more and you also have to do other things, but you, you just need to keep, keep those points, uh, you know, of service points going in to, to earn the Grandmaster service requirement. Of course. I might make Grandmaster 2 someday. Yeah, it might be another couple of years, but right. I'll, I'll I'm trying to show off for Dave. Dave, welcome mm -hmm. to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Now you, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't, uh, you, you, you gave me my BJCP test years ago in Sacramento and, um, I almost failed. So I want to, <laughs> I want to thank you for that. And it was, it was a cool experience and, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun and you were very, very helpful and, uh, you, uh, were a great teacher. And I think you, you obviously have a, a very good knack for, being able to take this information and then disseminate it and, and make sure even dummies like me can retain some of it. So I appreciate that very much. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't really know. To, I don't really know. Um, uh, all right. So, so Cooper, we're going to be talking proctoring BJCP exams. What did yes. we, what did we uh, drag poor Dave up here for? What's, uh, well, I, I, I proctored uh, my, my first exam in a while um what does you know, that I, mean I, let's start I, let's start again because we're talking about people who, okay you know like me so, who don't know anything yeah so david was the exam uh, administrator he gave an exam group uh, and and uh, uh somebody down in the silicon valley scissors ran a a study course along with it and a lot of uh, uh 
potential judges and existing judges that wanted to improve their rank. Uh, you know, did a lot of studying. He gave the exam, but you can't just show up with beers, give the exam, give the examinees the beers and hope that like, okay, well, they'll, they'll be able to rate these beers. And even if you give the descriptions of what the beers were to the graders, how are the graders going to know what, uh, what you're, what you're, what the examinees were tasting, unless somebody who is experienced ah, as a national yeah. or above uh, beer judge can taste alongside with the examinees. Of course, the, the exam administrator is busy running around, you know, pouring beers and shuttling them around to the, to the examinees. Yeah. Proctors, there's, there's usually two or three proctors sitting there alongside uh, in usually a separate kind of removed area from the examinees who are taking the exam. Uh, tasting the same exact beer at the same exact time, poured the same way, presented the same way, and making, filling out a much more detailed uh, uh, score sheet than you than your regular, uh, you know, beer score sheet. It is, <laughs> it's actually it takes up both sides and it's longer and there's there's two or three more lines in each section for you know filling out all the different attributes and making sure that you really comment fully on everything that's there. So. I take it very seriously when I proctor an exam. I want to do do well by not just the examinees, but also the graders. Because as a grader, I just I hate it when you get an incomplete score sheet. It's like, oh, this you know master or national rank judge didn't comment on the malt in this bach. Okay, yeah, that's uh, not good. Uh, what was it? You know, <laughs> usually, usually those kind of judges are more experienced, and the, the exam administrators will pick someone who who does know what they're doing but it's it's a uh, you know there's a list of people that are qualified to do this um and uh you know we invited a newer for this exam that was given last saturday uh we invited a newer uh I, well i don't know if he he's did you say it was his first time proctoring well he's a newer member of our community okay so he oh. just moved to the area but, uh, okay. yeah. I, we, we won't name names or anything okay but yeah no, but he's a master <laughs> level judge he'll do yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> he knows stuff, for sure. Yeah, but I, I, pig. I remember as a national, when I had just made national and I was qualified to be able to do this and, and David invited me to proctor it. And I, I sat down with Nate Smith and uh, proctored an exam at the hop yard in, in uh, Pleasanton. And uh, wow, I mean, it was it was a pressure feeling. And, and, and you know, David does, sometimes he gets a little tricky with his beers. He, he wants to present oh. a wide variety. You're supposed to, as an exam administrator, present, you know, a few lagers, a few ales, some beers lighter, some darker, some hoppy and malty styles, and some beers with off flavors. And you mostly want to present home brews uh, as an exam administrator. But sometimes things like, like dosing beers and, and blending different things with beer <laughs> uh can happen so uh, i think that blending different things with beer what are you talking about because we're trying you because what are you trying to do with it are you trying to throw yeah. people you're not trying to trick people but you want to you want to test the limits of their yeah vocabulary or, or what's the point with these you want to style you... perception i think is what i was going for because i know okay. <laughs> i threw up brian and the guys for a loop on that first <laughs> beer it's like i said mm -hmm. Judge us as a German pills. I'm sure they all remember those exact wording. It was not a German pills. Okay. What, what was it and how do you, what do you do to it to make oh. it confusing for the, for the uh, you know, examinee or whatever? All right. Because I told Brian also afterwards, it's like, oh, that was a, a bottle and a can of Municalis. And then I added a bottle of spring water. Uh, What's that going to do? Uh, uh, like, hey guys, you know I think this that's beer's a little watery. That's going to decrease bitterness a lot. Yep, yep. Right. It sure did. And, and I remember I was and like, hoping it, they'd catch it. It, it had <laughs> some. It had some flavor characteristics, a lot like, you know, a, a lot of German characteristics, but it also had like this mouthfeel and the and and the body and the the flavors and the just the way it played was like an American light lager in some ways. That's it. <laughs> and I pulled out oh, in the flavor. I definitely remember commenting on that. Um, maybe I was a little, I might've been a little too kind on the score, but I think I, I was probably the lowest score for that beer. Uh, but still maybe a little, it, it came out a little too high in the overall than we might've liked, but I don't know what the examinees did with it. We can't really discuss that here because it's not a graded exam yet, but it was just okay. it was an All interesting right. experience and, and just 
like I could tell that there was something off about this. I'm like, this is one of David's tricky beers. Mm. But, um, yeah, no, he, he did a good job presenting a lot of different styles yeah. and, and uh, blending different commercial beers. In one, in one case, the blend of these two IPAs was, was way better than the sum of its parts. Like there was one that was, you know, classic old school American IPA. And the other one was like this modern, really bright, but super low bitterness, you know, modern IPA and blended together. They had, you know, the bitterness was, was a little more backed off than the classic IPA, but it still had some of these classic characters with a little twist to it, which mm -hmm. I felt was pretty nice. So, you know, nice job blending the beers. And sometimes you never know when you present it and mix it on site, how it's going to come out. But you try to present a number of beers as an administrator that are going to score high, medium, and low. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times David's awful beer is is a hot mess. And it's just a mm -hmm. really, really bad homebrew with just barely drinkable with all kinds of, then you feel generous giving it that, that lucky, uh, that, that, yeah. that, that courtesy 13 score. That's where um, all Brian Shars beers go. Well, yeah. exactly. Beckham's, but you know, uh, as as an examinee, what's interesting is like that stuff about is you know David's not the only one that can be tricky about having beers to to judge when you're you're trying to take the exam, and it I would always be way too conscious of am I getting tricked? What's going on here? And part of the value of having these doing these things like the mixing the spring water and and the Hellas is to as an examinee, if you want to get up to a higher rank, if you want to be a master or a grandmaster or, or national or what have you, I think it's important to just don't worry about what might have been done to it. Drink it. It's what's in front of you. Write about what you taste, smell, perceive about what's in front of you, period. And that's it, it took me a lot of times to advance, taking the exam to advance in ranks. I would just worry too much. What's what's happening here? What's with this? What's with that? And it's that I'm just going to relax and write what I taste. And that's where I became a master judge. That's and I think, true. I think that's the key. And that's what I remember from, from David's classes too. It's like, yeah. you know, our roles as beer judges is to write what we taste and how that's it right. compares to the style, not to assume yeah. what happened yeah. to it. Because you you have the as a proctor you have the same exact information that a an examinee is given with that same beer. Judge this as X. Uh, you you can use the style guidelines, and you can you know uh, you know write a little take a little more time writing a, a full sheet and 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 uh, filling out the lines because you know, most of us can write pretty quickly and and uh, get it done. But you know you really need to be the eyes and ears and nose of that of the graders to, to so they can suss out what what this beer really was in combination with the description that the exam administrator gives yeah. to the, the graders as well so he's like i did this it's got it's one third water yeah <laughs> I, I think that's a cool out. tool for for homebrew clubs as well david what 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 other sort of like uh messed up beers have you given these guys for for different um you know for for different uh Exam. Exams. What else have you Before done? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, you can always count on me probably uh, offering something that is not to style. Like like the first one. Yeah. Something ah. will have like a contamination issue. Something's like, ah, sour. Oh, that's terrible. Or it could be a diacetyl uh, bomb or something. Or it's like, okay, this one's got a, well, well then the first one would have a uh, recipe issue. And then the second would have a, a process issue. Hmm. And then there's going to be something that should be excellent. Something I hope the mediocre. Um, and I always try to, uh, well, there should be something that's German, British, there should be a Belgian, there should be American. And this is probably the first exam I've ever given where I just had one American style. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I realized that afterwards, like, wow, that's kind of different, but it was just uh, the American IPA. Well, you can almost count on like an American IPA or pale ale. I mean, that's like one third of every competition is one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Pretty and I much. loved it when we got the, uh, the Merzen and it was like brown. <laughs> like, uh, uh, okay. Like, like our, our friend John Watson used to take uh, exam beers, like a six pack of like a, a Budweiser or something and put them on the roof of the garage at his parking uh, place oh. at his apartment for a week. And he would take oh. it down like a week later. And yeah, that talk about a thing is hard to give a 13 to. Like, holy cow. <laughs> Especially with this summer in Sunnyvale. 
Oh boy. It's ruthless, man. Yeah. Yeah. David, well, how long I, have you been how long have you been doing this? How long have you been uh, judging homebrews? Uh 1997 is when I took the exam for the first time and uh wow. And how how odd to think that yeah, it's pretty slow at first. I may have done like a, a couple a year or so and then it took a while it's like, well, somebody's going to give classes around here cuz uh local homebrew club uh, stopped doing that. It's like, okay, then I picked up the ball on that. And then it's like, okay, then I can give the exam. And I've been giving exams since 2002. Wow. Yeah, that's a long time. That's 20 years <laughs> next year, man. Yeah, that's that's pretty wild, too. And a yeah. lot of those years, I would do like three exams in a year of different stuff or four. Yeah. Wow. And, and you're able to Mountain View to help those guys. Jeez, I would never go to Mountain View for anything. What? Um, <laughs> and, and you, up there. And you're putting this together, or is this? Oh, no. You know, uh, here's a packet of information, and then do do they make does the BJCP make it easy to put these on? Or uh, it sounds like you're sort of crafting exactly what these these exams are. Oh well, well as I know the person that was putting on the uh, the classes, and I did that once before. So Michael took care of a lot of that stuff. But hey, I traveled down with the beers and presented the exam, and I got gathered the information send it on to BJCP when I'm done and, you know, keep the process going. I mean, I mean, I've done this oh. enough times. Like, okay, I can get the process going. Hey, I got some new judges into the system. Or yeah. It's a lot of paperwork and, and record keeping. They make it fairly easy for you, but I think the hardest part is, is selecting the beers and making sure that you have a good variety of beers as an exam administrator to present for the proctors to taste and really to, you know, to be able to comment on so that, you know, when they, the graders see these, these examinees sheets next to yours, if they're picking out like, okay, oh, this proctor said, yeah, it, it came across like a light lager. And they, you know, the, score, the examinee says, oh, yeah, it was a little too light for, for a, you know, a pills, I thought, or, or you know, um, that stuff comes through. And in combination with the descriptions that David gives them, uh, you know, as a grader, you get a pretty good picture of what was going on. Usually the, the proctor sheets are, are very good and, and it's a good grading experience. You're working with another grader to get that done. But the, yeah, the proctor sheets are, are just pretty much all you have for descriptors. Um, yeah. That sounds like a nightmare. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sort of having flashbacks of, of doing my test and I think it was, uh, I, I forget, I forget this, this style, but the recipe was a Doppelbach, but I, I forget, I forget what was wrong with the beers, but it's like, uh, it, there, there's a lot of stress and pressure there too, because like Char, like you were saying, I know something's wrong. I think there's something wrong. I don't know that there's something wrong. And then you're sort of like in this, you know, headspace, but you have a limited time to do it. And you're thinking it's, it, it's a, it's a ton of pressure. And uh, it, I feel like, is. I feel like we is. all need therapy from, uh, uh, from Mr. Uh, Tech. Uh, uh, well, what, yeah. one of the important things to think about too, about the proctoring is that, your, your grade on the tasting exam is not just based on what you perceive. It's based on how close you are to the average of the proctor's scores, right? So okay. that's, All right. that's, that's, a, that's a part of your score, right? And I, I always forget what fraction that is, but a part of your tasting exam is, okay, let's say the proctors both settle on, oh, this beer is a 40 and you gauge it. Uh, 39. Great. You're close. You, and you gave that's it it's 20. Level. Whoa, that's really bad. But the problem is one of the problems I've, uh, you know, technically you're not supposed to, as proctors discuss your scores with each other. Uh, and you can be, I've, I've proctored exams with people who are good judges, but who just, we've just been divergent on everything. And you get to the end and it's like, Oh, I scored this a 38. I gave it a 24. Like, Oh God. Then, no one in that exam is going to advance because oh. no one, yeah, someone, if, if, if someone gave it a 38 and someone gave it a 24, someone's just wrong objectively. <laughs> and you average okay. those and whoever is, because that, that's just, that's too far apart. You wouldn't do that in competition. So objectively, let's say whatever score you have, you're going to be a ways apart, whether the 24 or the 38 was wrong, you're going to be, yeah, you know, that average is going to be something you're going to be, you know, seven, eight points away from. Well, you don't, you uh, don't but as, as a proctor, you don't have to average it. So it's like we, average. we it's talked about the beers, nobody adjusts their scores and we did not adjust our scores. Uh, but we do talk about the beer and like mm -hmm. two of the judges give it, you know, a 34 and 32, 
you might give it in the other judge's office rocker and gives it a, a 40. Mm. You, you're going to give it more in that, you know, you're, if once you talk to them and say, oh, well, well, this really was this or it was off style, right. it should have been, should have yeah. been more towards the 30. Just, then it, you, oh, yeah, I agree. After all, it's like, right. that's yeah. why I always like to have three proctors. It's a three. consensus. Yeah, I, I, to yeah. I totally yeah. agree with you because with two people, it's easy for one person to be on tilt, not to be malicious or bad or objectively wrong, but anyone can have like an off day and somebody can be on tilt with something. But when you got three, it's obvious if somebody's on tilt. Uh, and yeah, then you can come to like a finer, final proctor assigned to score or something. Uh, and it's not like you've got two guys that are just going head to head. And I've, I've had that experience with, with good judges who are proctors and we've just been, you know, this far apart on every single thing. And then I just felt really bad for everyone taking that exam because there's right. just not, <laughs> there's no one to referee. There's no final assigned score other than the average. And yeah, I, I, Dave, that's totally right to go with three. That's, that it's the only, the only fair thing to do when you're, you're trying to give the exam. Yeah. I mean, and that so, said though, you, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, uh, it's only 20% of your score and it's pretty forgiving. You know, you can be, uh, you know, uh, the, your variance from, um, uh, you know, there's 20, 20 points per beer for your scoring accuracy. So you can still get a 10 and be nine points off from the proctors, you know? So that's, you're, you're halfway there. You're almost to the survey. You can be, get a 12 and be seven points off from the proctors. It's mm -hmm. fairly forgiving. If you're in the territory where you would be in a competition from the consensus score, you're not going to do too badly. If you luck out and get a point and a half or two, you know, a couple points away from, uh, from the proctors, then you, you'll get, those higher scores will average in and you'll do pretty well. But yeah, sometimes there's a grade or two. It surprises me. I'll, I'll grade an exam. I'm like, ah, this exam wasn't that great, but then they have like awesome scoring accuracy and it pushes them up to a whole new level. And you're just like, really? Yeah. They're, they're national. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, a good grader would look at it holistically. It's like, wow, these really persons really got their perceptions right. And they described it well, but it's like, man, their scoring is like way too harsh or something. It's like, ah, oh, that's not good yeah. judging. So when it comes to, uh, well, the proctors, like if Brian says, suppose you have a situation, one proctor gave it a 20, the other gave it a 30, the other gave it a 40. Well, uh, the graders will sort that out. See, I don't lose sleep over that. And the examinees shouldn't either. The graders, if they're good, should mm -hmm. be able to sort it out. Yeah, yeah. agreed. Well, one of the most interesting proctoring one of the most interesting proctoring experiences I had was in, uh, I got sent to a proctoring exam in, Hol in Honolulu. And, you know, at, as uh, you know, they, you need a certain number of, of national or master rank judges to, to proctor the exams. And if they're not enough on the islands, like there really wasn't at the time to, to go and do that. I got a little stipend to help towards the flight. I it, had to pay some of it, but I went there and um, I was judging with Bob Hilliard, who was like, what, you know, one of the guys who was in, he was in my first exam that David gave in Pleasanton back in 2008 for us when I became a judge. And uh, he, he was proctoring with me there and we got this beer and it comes out, we're looking at it and it's got this like oily stuff floating on the top. And we're like, what the <laughs> hell is that? We weren't talking about it yet, but I was looking at it. I'm like, geez, what is that? And it smells a little bit like butter. And I was like, okay that's weird we tasted it. it was like it was a buttery beer but uh so it ended up being a dosed beer and instead of adding uh you know a diacetyl which you know the chemical diacetyl uh it was used you know which used to be you just buy artificial butter flavoring in the mm -hmm. grocery store and it would be usually like a diacetyl you know with water or alcohol or something and dose the beer and it's fine you know if you drops of that plenty buttery but this yeah. also had the oily impression it was like swirling around and they were weird and just like oh my god I, I, how would someone how would you comment on someone to improve that beer like well don't <laughs> yeah. put oil in your yeah, beer take the oil us. out yeah uh, don't put a pat of butter in your glass before you pour the beer <laughs> yes leave off the butter but yeah I mean, sometimes 
ex ex exam administrators will try to get a, a little too tricky, but and it was <laughs> it was probably hard for them to know. Uh, like, I, uh, sure, uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, you should probably do a, a test run maybe if you're going to do any dosing as an exam administrator with your ingredients. <laughs> but David, you just, usually, yeah, you want the the flaws to be from the home brew, usually from a home right. brew and a, just a really bad one. And I've also been the one who's been off my rocker too. Like, I I, I scored a beer like a it was, and I gave it like 30 for some reason. And it, it, it was, it was actually an exam that Lee Shepard was giving back in mm -hmm. the day. And, uh, you know, we missed Lee, but, um, and it was his, one of, it was a really just over the hill and weird beer that he had he mixed with a bunch of weird stuff and with some sourness There's some muddled flavors and, and everybody else was at a 20 Gross. and I was, I was kind of a younger proctor and I just like, yeah, you guys are right. Consensus is definitely more towards that 20, please. Yeah. So, you know, we, you figure it out, you sort it out and usually you get pretty close. So um, I'd like to think I'm a little better at, at that now. <laughs> Maybe we all, we all have our off days. And, yeah. you know. David, do you do any, um, any judging yourself or is it just on the education side? Oh, I uh, judge whenever I can. I was down at that uh, county fair and just south of you. What county is that? Oh, like county? 20, what's that? Alameda County, Santa Clara, Santa Clara. Okay. There you go. They're like 25 entries. Well, me and my friend, Dan, fellow beer judge, like we'll make the trip down there. We'll make the trip. That, that makes just for a nice showing too. So, Hey, thanks for making it down here too. Well, I was down there. I uh, got a couple of people for the, uh, that California craft brewers cup with the 1225 entries. So I try and get around. <laughs> well, you do a good job, man. David gets around. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for the show. Yeah. And if anyone does want to become a, a beer judge proctor, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an important role and, and yes. you earn service points for it. And uh, it's really actually a lot of fun. Just it is fun. Judges, I agree with Brian. Supporting uh, an exam administrator and a bunch of new potential judges or people trying to improve their scores. So yeah. yeah I, how I do think... we, how do we do that? Do we, David, do we reach out to you or, you know, what's, what's well, the, Whoever okay. might be administering an exam. Hey, Brian, are you uh, proctoring anytime soon again? Yeah, well, I'm actually proctoring this Saturday with you, I think. Oh, you are. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we get to work together. Uh, yeah. As you see exams popping up on the exam schedule, if you're, if you're someone who's never proctored before and you're at the national or above rank and you want to try it, definitely contact that exam administrator and ask them, okay. you know, if they would uh, consider having you as a third proctor and just let them know you're new, but you really want experience and uh, you're interested in doing that. It's, it's really a lot of fun and it's, it's a rewarding yeah. experience. And last question, David, are you going to get uh, judging points for being on this show? Uh, for educational purposes. I didn't have a beer. No. Oh, damn. Mm. And we could mm. have uh, registered that with the uh, C continuing education program, but mm -hmm. uh it's too much of an afterthought, and uh, ah, we didn't do anything anyway. <laughs> and and speaking speaking of points and stuff, did we mention points. that uh, Dave is a Grandmaster Seven? We did, Brian. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, <laughs> okay, it takes a lot of points. Exactly. Yeah, it really does. Well, I'm trying to get these boys points here too, yeah. um, because yeah. you know we do this we do this twice a month, and uh, you know we're they're filling out four score sheets a month. But uh, they don't have anything to show for it. It's not that much. Really. Because because I see, because the Grand Masters above want to keep you guys down. That's what it is. <laughs> Gorda! <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway, David, <laughs> thanks, man. I really appreciate you coming on and, and, and chatting a little bit. And maybe we'll have you on for another topic and uh, okay. get a little more in-depth into judging. Okay. Yeah, cool. You just have to have to work your ass off like Dave to get up to GM7. Yeah, he's absolutely. Got the, the giant score sheet behind him there to prove, you know, that he's a what beer educator. Can you is that what that means? I remember we had those Barely. printed. printed got the AHA oh, logo. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's a cider score sheet. Uh, nice. Different one. I got two of them. That's cool. That's, that's really neat. Sweet. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back. We're going to wrap things up here on Dr. Homebrew. David, thanks, man. All I right. really appreciate your time. I am going to go now. Right. I have to work in the thanks, morning. Thanks, man. Oh, God. All right, get some tea. All right, brother. Take care. See ya. All right, Bye. Bye, man. All right, and we're going to be right back here on Dr. Homebrew. Hang on. All right, we are out of here, you guys. Thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of Dr. Homebrew. You got your commercial calibration, and you got your highfalutin BJCP judge talk about proctoring exams and mainly how to fuck with everybody in your homebrew club. 
I think that's what I've learned out of this. Mm. You know, you take a bottle of Hellas from Bevmo or whatever, you water that sucker down with some carbonated water, and you go, here, try my German pills. Guy who won't shut up about how he likes lagers a whole lot. See what you think of this. Yeah, I'll try, my, try my German IPA. Yeah. Huh? Do stuff like, like that. Uh... Mess with people. I would like to thank Five Star for helping us make good homebrew, even though we didn't taste any homebrew on this show. Uh, but I would also like to thank the uh, didn't the Kölner Hofbräufru Kage Brauerei für Beer for this can of, of tasty Kölsch. Yep, me too, man. Um, so if you want, to, they're good, yeah. If you want to get on the show, Brian at thebrewingnetwork dot com. That's what you got to do. Send us homebrew. If you have any friends who want feedback on beer or whatever, send them our way. We need beer. We need wine, cider, variety. Yeah. kombucha, whatever you guys want, whatever you ferment at home, send it our way. We will judge it accordingly. And if we don't know how to do that, we will bring on the person who does. We want an all IPA be- show. It's coming up, I think, next. <laughs> Is it really? Uh, it Collins could be all, all, it could be great beer. It could be terrible beer. It could be, we should have an all terrible hazy IPA show for two shows in a row. No, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Thanks a lot again for tuning in. And until next time, we'll see you later.